Alright guys, so um, here we are. I'm standing in front of the drum kit that we're going to be recording today for today's uh, uh, session. Laid out in front of us are the microphones that we are going to be using uh, okay, in this uh, uh, for today's session. Starting from here right in front of me, this is the uh, Bay Dynamic TG70D. Right, so this, as you can see, is a dedicated kick drum microphone. Um, you can really, really identify kick drum microphones by the shape and the look. Like they're always kind of designed that way. They look like a hand grenade, right? Okay, so there are other famous, um, well-known uh, kick drum microphones like the AKG D112. You have the Audix D6. You have uh, Electro Voice RE20. RE20 is actually a broadcast mic, but you know it's very used often for kick drum as well. Uh, Audio Technica is the ATM 250, and there are a couple of other Bayer Dynamic mics as well because right, Bayer Dynamic is actually one of the uh, supporters and, and one of our uh, par supporting partners in this uh, workshop. Okay, so a big shout out and a big thank you to Bayer Dynamic. And moving on to this one, so this one is actually two mics. This is a uh, Audio Technica ATM 650 at the bottom. So this is a dynamic microphone. So do we call this a dynamic instrument microphone? Very typical, the most famous one is one knows, everyone can identify is the Shure SM57. So all the different uh, manufacturers like right, Audio-Technica, uh, AKG, they, uh, Audix, they all also make their equivalent, right? Their, their uh, equivalent of the SM57. So this is, this, is, this is it. So what I've done here is I have taped on top of here, this is an Audio-Technica AT4041. So the 4041 is a um, small diaphragm condenser, right? We call them small diaphragm condensers. Um, well, we also call them pencil microphones because that's how they look like. They look like a pencil mic, right? So small diaphragm condensers, um, slightly different characteristics to, to large diaphragms, which I'll show you later, okay? So you can see very, very weirdly, I have taped these two together, right? And you might be wondering why. This is what we call a, a multi-miking application and multi-miking has always been uh, something that um, a lot of engineers sometimes employ sometimes they, they use this technique because they want to combine the best of both worlds they want to let's say they want to take a characteristics of a dynamic right All right which is a you know, a good solid mid-range good good uh, mid-range presence um, and they want to combine the best elements of a condenser. Condenser will have, you know, a much wider frequency response. They capture all the low lows and the like high highs, right? And uh, much more faster transient response as well, condensers, okay? So you can combine both of them, mix and match. You can always blend it later and pick the, pick the best of both worlds. So I'm going to use this for the snare drum, right? So I have these two. And the reason why I tape them together is so that I make sure that the capsules, right, of the dynamic on the condenser are going to be as much uh, in phase, right, as possible, uh, okay, right. So phase is very important. When something is out of phase, when you, when you have phase cancellation, what happens is that you end up with, the sound ends up getting thin, right, you get some kind of weird comb filtering. Basically, it doesn't sound good, uh, right. No, so learn to identify how phase uh, cancellation sounds like, all right, L learn to be uh, allergic to it whenever you hear it you immediately can identify and and uh, spot the problem because a large proportion actually of um, issues uh, um, when it comes to oh recording sounds thin or it doesn't sound fat quite often it comes actually to face face issues right it comes down to face issues face cancellation right especially when we're doing with drums because we're having so many different microphones, you see? Now, moving on here, this is again another Audio-Technica ATM650. This I'm going to employ for the snare bottom, okay? Right, so snare bottom, um, throughout the years, I have, you know, changed different, different microphones. I previously used to use a small diaphragm condenser, uh, but recently I've gone back towards just using a dynamic, okay? So in this case, these two are identical, same microphones, one for the top, one for the bottom. And because um, for me, you know, these capped for the snare bottom is just more to capture the rattle from the snare. Okay, you are just trying to cap capture the the bite, the brightness that comes from the snare wire at the bottom of the snare. Lah. Now let's move on to the next one, the line. Okay. So this one, 
Looks really, really like cute shiny ball. This is a Bayer Dynamic M130. Now, you might not guess it by the appearance. You might think that this is a, a, a dynamic mic or something like that. But this is a ribbon. Ribbon microphone, the characteristics, right, uh, is that it has a much more warmer, a much more smooth, high-end sound. This has become one of my favorite microphones to use on a lot of things, like even on even on acoustic guitar, even on uh, um, guitar cabinets. We got you see this guy. We're gonna use this a lot throughout the whole workshop. Okay. The great thing about this is that most ribbons, if you if you saw just now during the the presentation, most ribbons by design are actually figure of eight, right? Most traditionally ribbon mics are figure of eight, but this is special. This is actually a cardioid. So being a cardioid, it opens up so many possibilities uh, of where it's going to be, be used. Now I'm going to use this, right, um, on the hi-hat, right? So this is going to be my hi-hat microphone. Now moving across, we got a pair of these. What are these? Okay, these are TG153C. This is a, also a small diaphragm condenser. As you can see, these are very, very small, super, super tiny, right? So it's helpful um, to sometimes get into tight corners, right? Um, small places where sometimes a big bulky microphone will be a little bit, uh, you know, it's a little bit hard to navigate and to get through, lah, right? So I will probably use this as a spot mic for the right symbol. I may use both. I may use one and I may use both. We'll see how, okay? Moving on. Okay, these are AKG C414. So the 414s are a, it's an iconic microphone. It's a microphone design that's been around for a very, very long time. Okay. Um, it's, it's a very, very famous and very, very well-known microphone now. Okay. So probably second to only the Neumann U87, right? Everyone looks at a Neumann U87, they know a Neumann U87. They look at the AKG C414, they also, right, uh, can also identify. These are the newer range. These are the X XLS, right? Which is the more modern version, right? The older ones uh, are the the B B O S, and they have so many other older models as well. They have the E B, the silver versions, and all that. But these are these are the uh, slightly newer versions. Okay, they are more modern because their polar pattern is all wow, using you know front panel push button switches one, so it's a little bit more uh, advanced lah. Okay, so I'm going to be using these guys as my overheads. Okay, because these are great. These are great on um, um, acoustic instruments. You can use your acoustic guitar, strings, anything that you know, needs to have that uh, um, detailed, bright, uh, uh, high end. Lah, okay, so these will deliver really, really well. Okay, so now I'm going to shift your attention to, I mentioned just now, a special microphone, right? Okay, so I'm going to shift your attention over there. So follow me, camera, to this guy over here. Right. This is a stereo microphone. This is a Vanguard uh, V44S. So again, um, Vanguard was very, very kind, very nice to uh, you know uh, loan some of these microphones for us to try and to check out. And uh, this is very special. This is a stereo microphone. Now, let me bring it a little bit closer so you guys can see. Right, let me bring it right to the middle. You can see that it's actually got housings for two capsules, one at the top and one at the bottom. So what this allows is that it allows you to obviously uh, capture in stereo and the application is very, very um, varied. So the top capsule is you can swivel it. Okay, let me do that. There we go. You can swivel it, right? And the way that it's detented, it's, you know, uh, it's already, um, you can adjust it so that you can move in increments of 15 degrees. So 15 degrees, right? You splay it out 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, right? And so on and so forth, all the way until it's 90 degrees, right? So, you know, if you want to capture as wide as possible, then you... Uh, uh, as wide as possible as stereo, right? You switch it out to 90 degrees. Lah. Okay. Using this, it also has the switchable polar patterns, right? So you can also record in something what we call MS mode, mid side mode, okay? So we'll play around with experiment with this. This one we're going to use for the room, right? We're going to use this as a, as a room microphone, okay? So very, very, very cool, right? So we'll check this out. 
Um, for the vocal session as well, during week four, uh, Vanguard also has um, uh, loaned us the, the V4, which is their, um, which is their uh, um, normal, their no normal doesn't mean bad, lah, right? Which is their, which is a great microphone. We'll use that for the vocal recording as well. Okay, so, right. So those are the microphones that we have, and okay, we're gonna get down. Oh, I forgot. Almost forgot. Okay, I forgot to mention the what we're gonna use on the toms. Okay, so right over here, and uh, if you guys want to take a look closer, also can. These are also from Bayer Dynamic. So these are uh, miniature condensers that are clipped on. This is the D57, right, C, and the D58C. Now, they're actually the same microphone, all right, um, but different model number. So the difference between the two is the D57 has the fixed uh, head, right, a 90 degree angle. But the D58 is on a gooseneck, okay? So it's in an adjustable gooseneck. Let me take it out so that the guys can see it, the student can see it. There you go. So this is an adjustable gooseneck, lah, right? It's the same microphone, same design, okay? So both sound exactly the same, just that the applications are slightly diff uh, the The mounting is slightly different. All right, cool. So I'm going to head on down now in placing the mics, okay? So this drum kit, all right, is a DW drum kit. Um, the skins are new; they've just been freshly changed uh, last night by by a drum tech, right? And uh, we had um, uh, um, uh, Shuheb, the drummer from uh, the band uh, Violet Remains, who is here. Hi, Shuheb. Okay, so he is ready tuned. He's ready set up this kit. All right. So when I enter a recording session, right, I always know put the mics up first. Okay. So I always let the drummer work on his kit, setting up his kit the way he likes it, all right? Make sure that all the positioning, he's got everything in tune until he's happy and he's really satisfied and comfortable with, uh, with, with, with his kit the way it's set up, lah, right? Um, I don't go in, all right? They, I have seen some places and I've seen some engineers who go in and kind of position everything there, uh, pre-position everything, and then, uh, then what happens? Drummer comes in and says, Oh, I need to move this and that. Lah. I need to switch this out. And then if you have all your mic stands all around ready, it makes, it, it makes the work harder. So for me, I keep these things. I put all the things out of the way. Let the drummer do, do his work first, uh, his or her work. Let him, let him set it up, tune the kit, do everything. Then only I'll move in. All right? Let the drummer give the drummer a break. Then I'll come in and uh, move in the mics. Okay? And now, we're going to move to positioning the microphones okay so let's start with the very beginning okay because that's a very good place to start okay all right first microphone i'm going to put would be the uh okay let's put this aside first right so that i don't actually knock into it and then you know and then uh i'll, I'll run away okay you won't hear from me. Okay, let's start off with the uh, kick drum microphone. Okay, now in um, most typical um, kick drums nowadays, right, especially those for more modern sounds, right, typically most kick drums will always have a front hole, right, uh, cut out in the resonant head on the front. Now, um, if you're going for a more vintage, authentic, traditional sound, then you don't have, uh, you don't, they, those those kind of drummers don't want a front hole, right. Uh, but that that will that will uh, require a different um, approach towards micing it. So in this case, we are we're doing a more of a modern rock, more of a contemporary kick drum sound. They would usually have a hole cut in the front. So what I like to do, right, right, I'm going to just share personally what I do because there's actually so many options. There's so many ways of of uh, recording and 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 micing. You know, you need to find and experiment which is the method, which way you. F you like like what's your preference like? now what i like to do is i like to actually have the kick drum mic um just slightly inside the hole right now there are some people who prefer to put it really deep inside close the closer towards the beater right because the reason is when you put it near the near the near the beater you capture more of the attack right but I kind of prefer it to be a little bit further back because I want to capture the overall... I want to capture a little bit more the body of the, the kick drum. 
but we'll see how okay uh we'll see how this kick drum sounds we'll start with the tip my typical uh, initial starting point and then we'll see right whether we need to push it in a little bit deeper or uh inside or, or a little bit further out now one word of warning about this kick drum these port holes uh if you're going to put it in around here there are certain positions around here because of the airflow that's coming out whenever the 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 beater hits the kick drum, right? When the drummer hits uh, plays the kick, the blast of air that comes out, there's always sometimes that certain position here where the velocity, the speed of the air that's rushing out, um, is so much that it will actually distort the mic. So you have to be you have to listen out for it, lah. All right. So if so, be careful not to put it. Um, you need to put it sufficiently far in. So usually I would kind of go. Just a little bit, just a little bit inside. Okay. Okay, let's tighten it up. Here we go. All right. Right. Okay. Just slightly inside. Okay. That that's why I, that's why I like it. Now again, as I as I said, if it's a more traditional, you use a traditional uh, sounding a uh, kick drum. Without the without the front hole, usually we will put um, a microphone. It was more towards the outside, lah. It will be outside the kick, right? Towards that. Now you can also always combine different different microphones. Like uh, for instance, right? Oh, let me let me take that. I wanted to show you guys just now. This is the example of a boundary microphone. This is also by Bayer Dynamic, right? So in this instance, what they will usually do is, this one is actually very idiot proof, right? You just chucho, plug and play, just throw it inside, right? Usually there's usually the padding, just throw it in the middle of that and it picks up the kick drum sound, right? So this can be also very useful as well. I'll just leave this here, right? And, uh, but I'm not going to use it. Lah. Now, I'm not very much of a fan of using the boundary mics in a, in a recording um, scenario. But uh, when it comes to live situations, it can be very useful because again, it's very convenient uh, to slide to to position it. Okay, so let's just leave it here for the time being. Okay, so that's kick drum mic. Let's move on now to the snare. Okay, and let's pick up the snare microphone. Let's move over here. Okay, so I generally would have these microphones, right? So there's a two of these, the dynamic and the condenser taped together. I generally have them maybe about two inches away from the edge of the rim, pointing towards the center of the snare. Now, um, okay, let's tighten everything up. So it's pointing towards the center of the snare and the Reason why is that you usually want to give a little bit of breathing space for the mics, right? You don't want to put it right up to the to the uh, to to the snare drum. Give about one or two inches away. And uh, why I point it towards the center of the snare is because that's what you want to capture. You want to capture the attack. You want to capture the overall the, the tone. Now, if you kind of uh, aim it a little bit more towards the edge, okay, towards the side you tend to pick out a little bit more of the overtones, the ring. So just be aware of that, lah, okay? Maybe that's what you want to capture, you see, right? But journey, I always kind of point it towards the center of the microphone. Okay, so next one, okay? Next other one, and uh, can you pass me? Colin, can you pass me the snare bottom? Oh, okay, you can pass me too. Thanks, man. Okay, so this is the same, the ATM650, and this is going to be the bottom mic. So... Bottom mic is going to approach basically from the opposite direction or from the bottom because this is going to capture the the snare, the rattle. Now, if you don't have enough, if you have, if your let's say your uh, interface or you don't have enough microphones, it is not necessary. You can sometimes uh, omit the bottom mic. You can skip it. It is not a compulsory thing, lah. Okay, because uh, this just gives you option. Okay. Now, a uh, very important thing to bear in mind is that, again, we're talking about phase. Remember phase? So this mic is being pointing from the top down. 
and this mic is pointing from bottom up. So what happens is that when if uh, what happens is that the sound waves are traveling in opposite directions. When it's being picked up by the mic and it's being recorded, what happens is that they are actually out of phase, right? So the sound wave on, on one end, you will have a positive wave, and the one on the other one, we have a negative wave. So what happens is that you can have some, you will have some kind of phase cancellation. So usually how we um, fix that, and in um, very typically, is your bottom snare, right? Either la, either one, right? You will have to invert the polarity. You have to flip the phase 180 degrees. Okay, so either the bottom. So in this case, let's let's just assume it will be the bottom one. Na, okay. Okay. Cool. Right. Let's move on. Next one, the hi hat. So what I love with the hi hat would be the Beidaning M160. Okay. Let's put the M160 over here. So, um, I see sometimes some discussions on forums, right? Or like endless discussions on how to mic the hi hat. It's like, uh, it's like crazy. Some people like go really philosophical. Okay, right? For me, it's just really simple. Okay, don't overthink it. For me, I kind of always like to position it towards. I like to position it um, vertically downwards, towards the. Uh, nearer towards the edge of the uh, hi hat. Okay, now um, yes, you can go a little bit more if you really want to go into detail, like how you want it to be. If you want the tone to be slightly different, you can like move it a little closer. You can move it like a little bit close towards the edge. You want to come in from a slightly forty-five degree, all right, uh, angle if you want to, but. For me personally, again, I'm going to share with you what I do. La. For me personally, I really don't uh, do, um, go to that much pain when it, when it comes to miking the hi-hat. Because majority of the sound, of the drum sound in my case, is going to be coming, is going to be captured by the overheads already. Right? The hi-hat is, the close mics in this instance, the hi-hat is just kind of just to fill in the space. Right? To fill in the, 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 stereo, the stereo space. Right? Just to fill it in again, polar pattern. You remember, okay, what I covered, what I mentioned earlier. Polar pattern is very important consideration, right? If you look at where all the mics and where they are facing and where they are pointing, right? It's always the intention is always to maximize and to take advantage of this those characteristics of the microphones, right? So there's a saying, all right. Um, it's a it's a it's a saying it's a phrase that's actually applied to mixing, but I uh, would love to apply it to everything re rega regarding recording and music production as well. So the original saying goes right there are it goes like this: there are no arbitrary decisions in a mix. So arbitrary here means that you know there is no decisions which are just made for the sake of the for for the sake of doing it. Right, right. So it means that every decision that's done, everything that's been, uh, every position, every mic that's chosen, where it's being placed, it's always done for a reason. It's not, it's not for some random reason or, or no reason at all. One. There's always a reason why it's positioned a certain way, why it's uh, being um, placed a certain distance, why I choose a certain mic. Okay? So obviously, um, what I do and what I use and what I apply is according to my taste, what I love to hear, what I like to hear. You know, when you go back, you can always experiment, right? You right? always always figure out your favorite combination, right? Of what you like and what you like to what what you like to position. So that's why these are all you know positioned in a certain way, right, to take advantage of polar pattern. So in this case, you know, I'm going to with these, these are going to reject some of the hi hat, it's going to reject, you know, this the the the, the symbol. Alright, so that's kick snare hat. Now, toms, I already explained to you, all right? Now, a very good thing about these uh, the clip-on mics nowadays, right, these miniature condensers, is that they're very convenient, you know? So, uh, in the past, you know, if we use, like, um, other, other microphones uh, and all that, uh, you need a mic stand, you need additional mic stand, and then it's like, oh, it's like really, really gets very, really cluttered and messy like, around the drum kit, Okay. So these are very convenient. I have the these two D57s here and the D58 right here. Okay, okay, cool. So that's the toms. Now, 
I am going to move on now to the, instead of the right, I'm going to talk about overheads. Okay, right. So now before I talk about overheads, I want to talk a little bit about stereo imaging when it comes to drums, okay? Now, uh, first thing, first point, I think, let, let's talk about it. Two questions that you want to consider. Number one is, what is the perspective of the drum kit that you want to present to the listener? So there are two options. Number one would be drummer's perspective. That means from me, lah, from, my, from my perspective here, right? Looking out, right? Um, sitting in the drummer's seat and facing there. So your second option would be audience perspective. Like, so from you guys, right? right? Looking over into the drum kit. So uh, which perspective do you want, right? Which perspective do you prefer? It's entirely up to you, right? It's up to you how you like it, right? Some people prefer a drummer, some people audience. Um, it's very funny. It's actually a trend. It follows trends. It follows styles. Mixing, right? Um, uh, mix and productions, is, it's like fashion. It's like clothing, man. It's like trend. You know, certain years, it's this kind of fashion. Then another year, it's out of fashion. And then another style, right? So I remember early in the 2000s and all that, it's very much audience perspective. So audience perspective means that you have your hi-hat on your left and the way that and the toms right when you listen to the toms when the tom field plays you hear it going from right to left okay from your side you're watching right to left lah, okay then somehow in i guess in the middle mid 2000s you see a gradual shift and a lot more nowadays towards drummer's perspective right so drummer's perspective now instead of a hi-hat being on the right now the hi-hat is on the left right and when the tom plays, when the tom field plays, it, instead of moving from this side to this side, it's now moving from left to right. Exactly like from, as if you're listening to this perspective. Lah, okay? Now, uh, I'm not here to tell you which is better or which is worse. I, again, it's personal preference. That uh, I have now preferred to do proud drummer's perspective. Lah, all right? Now, the, there's a couple of reasons why I like drummer's perspective. Uh, number one, when I'm listening to the music, let's say, especially if I'm listening on headphones, all right, all right, and then I'm, you know, when you listen to to music, you uh, you either play air guitar, you know, when you're really into it, or you play air drums, you know, and then when it comes to the drum feel, uh, if it's audience perspective, you're playing along, then it's like, eh, but then you know, inside your headphones, you hear the stereo imaging the other way because it's coming from audience perspective. For me, a drummer's perspective is a lot more immersive. It makes you feel like you are in the band, you're part of the band, you know? So that's kind of maybe the reason why there's a bit more shift towards the uh, drummer's perspective um, um, uh, style of panning la, and, and, and perspective, okay, when it comes to drums. Okay, now, one word of warning though. Uh, not warning, la, okay? Now, there is, however, one situation, right? where you will always, you will want to use an audience perspective. And can you guys guess what is that scenario? What situation you use an audience perspective, right? <laughs> right. Say it, yeah, live shows, right? Uh, a live concert, a live audience, okay? Right. So because if, let's say, the camera is, you know, uh, from an audience perspective, if it's a live concert, right, a live broadcast, it would not make sense, right, to have to see the drums, but then have the panning go like the opposite direction because visually it doesn't tally. So when it comes to live, yeah, live concerts, live recordings, or anything that has visuals, right, um, you will want to right follow the visual, uh, okay? You want to follow how it looks like from the audience perspective, okay? So again, next time you go to a live concert. Whenever that be, you know, whenever, you know, concerts can happen again, okay, you may, maybe pay attention to how the, they pan the, pan the drums. Lah. It's, I guarantee you it's going to be 99% going to be audience perspective. Lah. Unless, unless there's that one sound guy who decides to, oh, I like to pan my drums the other way around. Then you see when the drummer plays, eh, but the, but the drums pan the other way around. Okay, that's very unlikely to happen. Lah. Okay, so cool. So that's about stereo perspective. Now, when it comes to um, placing overhead microphones, I want to talk a little bit about, it's still related to stereo imaging, right? I want to little talk a little bit about how we as humans um, perceive our environment. So 
we are always um uh, we always perceive as humans we always perceive things in the vertical we always look at things as up down right and horizontal left right we always observe the things though we see how we build buildings like we how, how we build our structures how we design our, our 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 everyday objects it's always you know vertical or horizontal but however you got to bear in mind sound does not behave that way sound does not only behave in a vertical and horizontal plane it is all around is 360 degrees all around and the reason why i want to um uh, bring up this point is right when it comes to overhead overhead miking very usually what we usually learn whenever we go to audio school or what we usually taught okay because it's simple and basic you just put the two pair of overhead mics equi equ equally over, over each other and then that's it that's your that's your overhead ready now uh i'm not saying it's wrong it is not wrong okay but i feel there can be a better way there is always a better way to look at it now uh okay so let's draw and let's try and look around the kit okay i'm going to walk around the kit and i'm going to draw an imaginary line right i'm going to visualize an imaginary center line okay right uh where i want my stereo imaging to be so let's say let's look at it okay drum kit the front is here lah. so let's draw the center line here like this right where my hand is going center line is here if you put the center line here you measure an energy line here where's the snare it's on the left right and uh, the, th the first tom is going to be slightly to the left then these two toms are more heavier to the right right if you look at this then the snare is going to be slightly to the left logically speaking like if you are really considering this as your center line your stereo image right this is logically how it's going to be but do you pan your snare to the left in the mix right uh unless you some want to do some creative uh creative uh, uh mixing lah, right so no we always keep our the the important elements the kick and the snare towards the center of the mix so you want to shift i would consider ask you to consider to try and shift your perspective a little bit take a walk around the kit and see where the center image is actually going to be take a walk around take a walk around walk around and see where the center image is so if you actually consider where the center image will really be as it would appear as you would hear it over a pair of speakers or or, or headphones or anything for me again and again this is me my center image and center line is actually here like this slightly to the side you know it's slightly angled this way so that way the kit is actually overall balanced a little bit better right so i always keep that in mind right whenever i'm positioning my uh overhead microphones lah, okay so uh do you guys get me there what i talk about you know so again this is not something that um i see a lot of people talk about right um it's definitely not in a lot of textbooks it's definitely not a lot of articles that you find online right but this is um something that i was taught and i was i was learner so hopefully i can share it with you guys right so look at it look at the drum kit this way right don't just vertical horizontal look at it in a much more broader bigger broader perspective okay so now when it comes to uh, overhead miking I'll, I'll talk a little bit more on the different techniques right there are usually two uh, typical ways right you usually have what we call the space pair doing doing an a b okay and you also have what we call the uh, x y method now i'm gonna, not going to spend so much time on that because otherwise all right I'm just going to show you what I prefer. Now, when it comes to drums, I like to use the space pair, the AB AB uh, uh, method. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, uh, okay, I want to take the first microphone. So I'm going to take the four one four, and I kind of always start from this side first. I always like to put the right overhead somewhere kind of over the floor tom so i'm kind of capturing this side of the of the of the kit right more towards this side so again bear in mind my center line is here right it's coming in coming in this way so here we go let's extend all these so I typically like to keep my overheads low, 
all right? Um, there are some people who like to keep it high up. Again, there's no right, no wrong. You decide whatever works best for you, you know, whatever sounds best to your ears. Uh. Okay, let's make sure that it's tight. Okay, all right. Made in Slovakia. Hmm, the, 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 the shock mount. Okay, cool. Like, so generally over this area. So that's my starting point. Okay, now, let's going to grab the second overhead microphone. Right. Ah, let me do a little sidetrack, okay? A quick, quick uh, word of advice and word tip on how you position mics and microphones on the microphone stands. Because I see this uh, mistake done very often, right? So let's see. Whenever you have any kind of a mic, all right? Now, uh, the general rule of thumb is, how do you want to position your boom? So um, I'm going to sort of show you, and this is going to be a little bit of a risky kind of a maneuver, risky stunt, you right? Don't try this at home, okay? <laughs> or don't try this with an expensive microphone, okay? Uh, Richard is really having a nervous look on his, on his face. Don't worry, man, I've done this before. I've never, I've never dropped the or, or dropped the mic yet <laughs> so far. Okay, right. So here's what I mean. Uh, very often I see whenever um, mics that are on boom stands, you know, so sometimes they're positioned like this. Okay, why is this dangerous? Correct. Right, the you do not have the, the leverage where the center of gravity is. Tips, right? If this is like if this was a heavier microphone and I extended it fully, lah, it would have been much easier to tip the microphone. So, generally, rule of thumb is always make it in line with one of the feet or the, the, the tripod feet of the mic stand so that how you push it so it won't tip over, right. Unless you literally force it over, lah. Okay, then, then, then the one I uh, cannot, cannot, uh, cannot say anything, lah. Right, that one is that is doing something silly already. So this, right, there's a very high chance it will tip and fall and fall over, right. So bear this in mind, because I have had situations where uh, audio graduates from an audio school told me that their lecturers told me that this is correct. <laughs> it's like, oh no. What do you paid all the school fees for that, you know, to be taught something wrong, okay? So anyway, that's that's a little uh, sidetrack into into regarding our mic stands and how you position mics. Okay, cool. So now this one is this also you already flipped this over, right? Okay, cool, man. Richard is amazing, man. He always like is super super on point on on anything. It's like oh, I need this. It's like poof, it's done, right? It's always poof. Oh, oh, it's done already. Okay. Super man, it's amazing. Okay, cool. Uh, so where I position this now, typically if you look at the textbook explanation of how to do overhead, they always show you, oh, so do it over here lah. You know, put it at the exact same place so that it's equal, right? Now, it looks good, but that's the thing, it only looks good, <laughs> okay? Sound wise, if I'm gonna put my um uh overhead over here so that it looks exactly equidistant over the kit, all right, the snare is gonna be so much louder, it's gonna be skewed towards this one side, right? So your stereo balance is, is already off. So I've never really understood why in textbooks and, and you know all the articles they always show you the overhead patterns this way. It's easy to understand, like it's easier to explain the concept, but you know, in practical real life, you know. To to me that doesn't to me it doesn't create a balanced a stereo image, nah? Okay. So where I like to put it, I like to put it somewhere here. Okay. So again, bear in mind, my stereo image, my stereo center, is here. Okay. So I would want to put this baby somewhere. Okay. Over here. Let's extend this a little bit more. Okay. Now, this is a starting point. Okay, right. Uh, I need a microphone cable. Could you pass me one mic cable? And this is the next step that I'm going to do, okay? So the next step that I will do is I'm going to 
make sure that the overheads are going to be in phase. And uh, how I do that is very simple, right? Just use one microphone cable. Thank you. It's okay, I got it. Just, just give it to me first, right? So very, very simple. Okay, from here, from the drummer's position, so you take one end of the mic cable, doesn't matter which end, okay? Right? Or you could use a string or you can use measuring tape if you want to be, you know, a little bit more crazy, a little more advice, uh, 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 precise. You want to use like a laser measure, also can if you want huh, to, be, to be crazy. But old school style, just take, a, just take a cable. From the center of the snare, right? Stretch it out, pull it out towards the capsule. Okay. So this is the distance from this microphone to the center of the snare. And then we do the same and check with this guy. And four, almost, close, right. There's not a fluke, uh. this is, a, this is um, because I've done this so often that I, my eyes kind of can estimate where it is. So, correct. Uh. Okay, okay, right. Right, I need your uh, need your hand. Anybody wants to come and help help me? Right, wants to come? Oh, Richard lah, you come lah, okay? Right, okay. Never mind, Richard. Richard will do it. Okay, I just need it to be up like just a quarter of an inch, just like that. Yes, okay, yeah. Right, so okay, it's a very proud moment there. Uh, I managed to kind of eyeball the position, right? So, okay, yay, okay. Poof, all right. Okay, but th that that's not important, lah. Okay, the, the 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 that's not an important skill, right? So this is how I end up having my microphones, my overhead microphones. See, this is slightly higher. This is slightly lower, and if I again draw a line that between these two, and then perpendicular line, this is my stereo image, right? Okay. So any questions so far, right? Okay, if, if you don't have, we can we leave our questions for later, lah, okay? Right, so double check a few things you want to check. Make sure that, you know, the symbols and all that are not going to be impacting the, the mic. I almost forgot one last thing. Right, okay? Okay, so right symbol, I usually leave it later because this is where I want to call the drummer in. Come, Shihib, have a seat. Okay. So why it's important is because I want to know for this song, right? Uh, and you know this song and for the drummer how and where he's going to play the the right symbol. So Ashwip, can you play the part of the song which is the right? So show me where you're going to play it. Yeah. So it's mostly going to be on the the right self. There's no bell. There's no, you're not, not going to crash right in, right? Okay. Very cool. So it's very important to know, right? So is this song going to require a lot of bell work or it's going to require, you know, um, playing a lot towards the rim? And then you know where the drummer is playing. Lah. So that's where you want to position the, the, the microphone, right? So very quickly. Now, I've got a suspicion that uh, with the way that I've captured it, we probably won't even need uh, the right mic, but we're going to record it anyway, okay? So we can always use it. Lah. Right, so, oh, sorry, Shrip, can you show me again where you're going to strike it? Around there. Okay, now. Probably around here. Okay. Right. So, lastly, last thing I want to also want to check now with the drummer here, right? Um, always ask the drummer. Okay, w are any of these mics check with the drummer? Is it going to interfere that uh, when you are going to let's say do a fill a drum roll or you're going to transition from symbol to symbol? You want to check it out and see how does it feel? You know. Okay, this, uh, okay, very cool. This might be a little bit close, yeah? So, yeah, so that's cool. We can actually pivot this a little bit further here. This one, right? Yeah. This one, okay, again. Yeah. So, for the right symbol into the floor tom, it's also okay. Yep. 
Okay, cool. Excellent. All right. So always check. Make sure for me, all right, as this is why I mentioned I don't mic up the kid. Let the drummer work, do his work first. You always have to make sure that your musician, that the drummer, that the artist, the performer, no matter where they are, you have to make sure that they're always comfortable and they're always happy with their setup, okay? Right. So last but not least, and we're going to play around, okay? would be the uh, vanning on the mic okay so the stereo mic i guess we are going to just chuck it somewhere in the middle okay of the uh we're going to just chuck it somewhere in the middle of the room and uh later on i'll see we'll, we'll position it and here and see okay whether we need to put it a bit further back or not so as i mentioned the top capsule and the bottom capsule they are interchangeable i would let's see should i put them in Let's put them in a normal regular cardioid mode first. So both of them are going to be in cardioid. So one pattern, the bottom is going to be uh, facing, is going to be here. And the second one top is going to be 90 degrees. Lah, so we get the widest stereo capture as possible. So I guess maybe, okay, uh, maybe, okay. This is where I want to um, position the microphone. Uh, Shweb, can we just play the drum kit for me? All right. And what I want to listen for is I kind of want to listen throughout this room where the drum kit uh, is most focused, right? You know, I want to hear here where it's more focused. So just play the groove of the song, lah. Yeah, the 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 chorus or whatever. Just repeat. <laughs> Okay, cool. All right. So this is the position that I w that I wanted. Uh, you might maybe you can can Richard can you grab the mic and just chuck it bring it over here. So this is where it's gonna go. So what I'm kind of hearing for is I want kind of want to hear where the s the the low end focuses the most la. So it's kind of seems to be around here, right? So let's put this over here. This will be off at ninety degrees. Okay. This is the first time working with this mic, right? so uh, this it looks a little weird like, when you put the mic mic uh, like that, okay? But it'll be very cool. Let's cool. It'll be cool to see how it sounds. Um, what I would like, if it's possible later, uh, not now, now, is the maybe we can take the two gobos and sort of block off this the the stereo mic. Okay. We can do it. We can do it later, lah. Uh, right? So uh, what I've uh, gonna do is I'm gonna take the uh, gobos, the panels, right over there, and kind of position it in front of, of this stereo mic to block off the uh, direct sound right of the uh, of the drums so this is something that I also do in my own studio and the reason is because now at least here in Malaysia um, you know and and you know with with the with kind of the death of a lot of the big studios that we used to see lah, right in Malaysia we never had huge we used to have lah, right back in up to 2005 now nowadays we don't so most of our recording rooms that we have now are a lot smaller okay this room is actually very big fairly big for for it's very very big live room for a uh, studio in malaysia right but in general most of most rooms are actually lots way way smaller than this lah. so in order to make your room sound this is, this is going to be the room microphone in order to make a room sound big there are two things that you can do right number one you can physically make the room bigger okay all right <laughs> okay all right and uh, that obviously right that that this first choice obviously is out of question now uh, we cannot physically and uh, physically make the room bigger and put the mic further away now the second approach and the tip that you can do is all right when something sounds further away it's actually the ratio of your reflected sound, the ratio of reflected sound to the ratio of your direct sound. 
So you get where I'm going? If you can alter the ratio of your reflected sound versus your direct sound, it creates the impression that it's further away, you know, without actually physically being, you know, uh, further lah. Right. So this is you can how you want to take advantage, or maybe if you have a smaller room, or you have a smaller live room, or you're in a smaller studio, right? Um, uh, and you want to employ a room 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 microphones, right? Y if you don't have gobos, what you can do is instead of pointing towards the mic, pointing towards the drum kit, sorry, right? Point it towards the corner, point it away from the kit, right? Point it at the opposite direction. So you're capturing more of the reflections of the room instead of the direct sound, okay, of the of the drum kit. So uh, it's really no point um, if you are in. Unfortunately, there is also a limit, like It's no point if your room is too small, though. If it's too small, uh, room mics also might not be important, la. So again, you still need a sufficient size of a room, la. Now you can be a creative as you can be creative as well, right? Maybe you have a small room, but maybe you have a corridor or a hallway or another room, you know, somewhere else where you can open the doors and you can hear the drum sound from a distance. Maybe you can put the microphone there and capture it, you know. So uh, uh, over, in my s over in my studio, right, I'm on the first floor. Um, I have a stairwell, which is like three, it's a three, three, three story stairwell. So, and I want to get that really huge uh, 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 drum sound, right? I put the microphone, the stereo pad at the top floor, and it's like, oh, it sounds like, sounds like about two caves, man. Oh, <laughs> right? And it's natural. It's all natural reverb. You cannot replicate that kind of a sound with any kind of um, digital uh, uh, reverb or effect, lah. Okay. So this is kind of where it's gonna be, and we'll play around, experiment with it. You know, get Richard to move it a little bit closer, but maybe we just just mark and mark this position as our starting point, uh. All right? So cool. So that's our that's all for the microphones. After this, uh, we're gonna hook everything up. We're gonna do do the cabling. Okay, we're gonna hook everything up, and then uh, we will get into the actual recording. We we'll do a sound check, a line check, and we're gonna actually record and track drums. All right? So see you guys back in the next segment, okay? See you soon.